this is a show called Louis. I don't know if you know it. And Louis C.K.? Yeah, with Louis C.K. And <laughs> there's this thing called Bang Bang, which people that are probably watching know exactly what I'm talking about. It's this worst possible thing you can do in terms of meals, which is you go to a restaurant, do a full meal, and then you go to another restaurant and do a full meal. And you pet, oh. you, <laughs> exactly. Brutal. So they go Mexican, Italian, sushi, pizza, barbecue, IHOP, that, that one is disgusting. This kind of thing reminds me of the joy of food. Last time we were hanging out, we went, we went to see Joe do comedy and then we went to eat Russian food. Yeah. And it was a particularly fun experience to go to a Russian restaurant. I was yeah. the only person there that didn't speak Russian. Yeah. And eat Russian food with you. And um because I felt walking in they they trusted you. They didn't trust me. Yeah. The funny thing about the the people there, they were talking to you in Russian and then they refused to sort of uh, switch to English, even though they understood you speak no Russian. This is Russian house in Austin, by the way. Uh, anyway, what, uh, by way of question, what's the worst or, or the best, depending on your perspective, cheap meal? Let's call it a pigging out meal, but it could be a cheap meal uh, that you've ever had or you want to have that's like on the bucket list or something that's in the past, like where you did the something like a bang bang, which is like, you're, you're talking about multiple thousands of calories that you just feel horrible about yourself, but you still keep eating because it's delicious, but also great company. Something about the atmosphere is just right. Screw the diet, screw all the things you know, are just like you should be doing, but just throw it all out the window. I've done that. <laughs> uh, several times. times yeah i don't do this anymore but um the entire time i was a postdoc so five years and the entire time i was a pre-tenured professor so five years so i basically followed the uh tim ferris slow carb diet which is you know people can look it up but it worked really well it was basically some you know like good animal proteins you know fish and meat and things like Why that slow carb because oh, cause slow carb is like low carb. glycemic Got stuff it, is yeah, mostly yeah. lentils and beans and, and things and vegetables no no dairy no um anyway but then one pasta day in there sorry to interrupt no no pasta so it wasn't low carb but it was low glycemic carb and i did that and it worked terrifically well just for energy levels because i want to be able to train and work and then one day a week you're supposed to go full cheat day and so I would do what nice. used to be 12 hours, but then it became 24. You know, you start to redefine what the day is. Yeah. Um, and I would, and that was when Costello was pretty young and we would do it together. So I would get pizzas and croissants and donuts and I would just do the full thing. And by the end of the day, you don't want to look at a, an item of food. You're just repulsed by food. The only modification I made was the next day I would fast completely just to avoid the gastric distress of eating anything. And um, so I would do them on Sundays and then Mondays I'd fast all day. And then by Tuesday, I felt pretty good again. But Sunday and Monday, or you just feel like you're sliding down the slope of just blood sugar disaster. Terrible idea or a good idea? You know, at the time it, I enjoyed it. I love donuts, croissants, all that kind of stuff. What's interesting is after stopping that whole protocol, now I just try and eat well protocol. each day. <laughs> yeah, it's really a protocol. Now I basically, I do a pseudo intermittent fasting. I, I don't, I'm not really strict, but I'll start at eating around 11, eat my first meal around 11. I usually train in the morning, I eat my last bite of food somewhere around eight or nine. And I'm not super strict. I might have some berries or something late at night. Three meals, two meals, mm, two, Thumbs two, up. two meals. And then maybe a little bit of snacking on some nuts or something in the middle. I ever fast 24 hours. Never done a long fast, except when I was doing the, the, the two days out. and then um, and actually th there are a couple different ways to do cheat days that were fun. Like if you were in a new city, you could try all the restaurants that you wanted. Yeah. And I think Tim and our mutual friend, John Romanello did a, I think it was like a cheat day marathon where they did, you know, marathons, 26.3 miles. They went to 26.3 different locations in New York. They put it on a map and I never took it to that extreme, but. Wait, wait, you know, in over how many days? One day. That was their cheat what? day. <laughs> just because they were, you know. Just a, a little bit of something at each place. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there are things that guys do in their 30s that you just shouldn't do in your 40s. I can yeah. say that because I'm in my 40s. Yeah. And uh, now I just try and eat well most days. And what's interesting is about 12 to 14 months ago, I completely lost all appetite for sweets. I don't know what happened. I still love savory food. So meat and butter and cheese. Uh, and I love vegetables too. I love fruit also, but lost all appetite. So if you put a donut in front of me or ice cream or something like that, I just, it's, 
it's almost aversive to me. And I don't know what happened. I don't know what changed. It's probably a scientific explanation. Sure. It has to do maybe Neuron with loss, dementia. <laughs> <laughs> the sugar, the, uh, the desire for that rush maybe yeah. is gone. Yeah. From your uh, from your soul. So what was the most delicious thing? Is it croissant, donuts? What what is there a thing that um... there's a place in uh, Portland? I don't know if it's still open called Little T's Bakery, mm -hmm. and they have croissants that easily rival the croissants in Paris. People make a lot of the the pastry in Paris, but it's really the bread in Paris that's amazing. We lived there when I was a kid. And we did a sabbatical there. And, you know, there they do the baguette morning bake and afternoon bake. And th there's nothing like the bread in Paris um, or the people, you know. And, but if you're, in the, if you're in the Pacific Northwest, you know, you can find amazing croissants there. What do you do with the croissant? What do you do with the bread? Butter or is it just? I actually used to, I don't eat them anymore. I don't have much of an appetite for them, even though they're not a sweet food. But um, I'm always putting butter on the croissant. Butter on the butter croissant. No jam. No, I would never. I would never adulterate my croissant. I, I have to actually be honest about this because people talk about steak and they, they talk about bread with the butter. I feel like butter is cheating. I feel like you're disrespecting the fundamental food by adding butter because butter. It's like it's like it's like a elite version of ketchup. You're well, there we diverge because for me, bread is just a vehicle for butter. <laughs> A cracker is just a vehicle for cheese. Oh, so that's just the the it's, cracker and the bread is just texture. It's just that people look at you funny if you if you just eat the butter straight, which occasionally I do. I got it. But so I put a little piece of bread underneath it, not because I'm low carb, strictly oh, low carb, but just because otherwise you get some funny looks. Mm, that's like pasta is a, is a vehicle for, for pasta sauce. It, it's interesting, but like Indian non bread, you have uh, you have the bread. I've I, I've had a lot of soul searching on which part of Indian is brings me so much joy. Is it the bread or is it all the sauces that come with the bread? Well, there we diverge again because for for whatever reason, and no disrespect to anyone, but Indian food doesn't appeal to me. Well, you're a lucky man because the the number of calories in that food it sneaks like non bread. I don't know how non bread is made, but I think it's just soaked in oil and it just very intensely. Like the density of calories is very, very high. For me, barbecue, I would say, is probably the... That's good. Anytime I'm in Austin, I start thinking about barbecue. I do love, you know, I do love meat. My dad's Argentine. I mean, I love steak. I love meat. I mean, Argentina chorizo sausage is an appetizer before you have steak. So <laughs> It's meat on top of know. meat. And it's not just, you know, it's not just the men, right? Yeah. You see women, sometimes very petite women eating steaks that are bigger than their... The, their yeah. skull size, you know, slowly. <laughs> they eat very slowly there. And they all eat dessert too, which is interesting. And they generally do the sort of one meal per day and do that kind of reflexively. That's how I think about it because I often eat one meal a day, especially when I'm traveling. It feels like a cheap meal because it allows, it gives you a bit of more freedom to just lose yourself in the quantity of the food. I did the three day fast oh my. and I ate uh, chicken breast, like literally chicken breast with nothing else, just grilled. And it was the most delicious piece of meat I've ever eaten. And that uh, and that gives you, the problem is when you fast the three days, you really can't pig out. You really shouldn't. You oh, get, well, your stomach will shrink in size already. Your gut microbiome is almost completely depleted by fasting. A lot of people think, oh, cleanses and fasts are great for the microbiome. They quash your microbiome. However, when you start eating again, the microbiome comes back better than it was before your fast. For people who don't know, Sergey and Todd are on the call. They're kind of pulling stuff up. They just pulled up well, uh, Phelps. Phelps with the, I, I forget how many calories he was eating, 10,000. You know, what's interesting. There's some, some cool physiology around this. The reason he needed to eat so much is not that he was burning that many calories in pure movement. It's that when you do exercise in water, even if it's warm water, the heat transfer in water is greater. So you burn far more calories. And again, here I, I'm admittedly lifting that from uh, knowledge that was passed on to me by Tim Ferriss that I did not, so, but I checked it out and it's absolutely true. So if you exercise in water, mm -hmm. even if it's not really cold water, your caloric needs go way up, which is why you get out of the pool and you're often really hungry. And for fans of the Human Lab podcast, and and if you're not a fan, what 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 are you doing in your life? Uh, you would probably chuckle at the fact that uh, Andrew just cited his sources even on that statement because <laughs> you're so good at. I don't know how your memory works, but um, the only person whose memory is better than Joe Rogan is yours. <laughs>